Welcome back to the bunker. I'm Captain Logan. This time you made me watch iRobot, which is another early 2000s movie that I haven't seen since the theater and didn't initially care for uh, way back in the day that somebody is curious to have me go back and look at and see if my opinion has changed since then. This one requested by Malik Myers, who at some point heard me say, I think, that I didn't care for this movie and was surprised by that because he likes it. And so he asked me to go back and look at this and see if maybe my uh, sensibilities and uh, because of the, way in, the ways in which I'm not the same person I was back then, I might appreciate this more this time. It worked with signs. Uh, let's see how I feel about this one. So uh, immediately back in the day when this came out in 2004, uh, iRobot had a big strike against it for me because it's an action movie made out of Asimov's material. Now that's not to say that the movie itself taken on its own turns, couldn't be a really good action movie. But right away, I wasn't super interested in this. As soon as I saw the commercials, uh, you know, the trailers for this, I went, okay, so we're exploiting Asimov for a summer blockbuster. That's kind of unfortunate. Uh, if we're going to try to adapt any of Asimov's robot stuff, which is a really tall order in the first place, it's a real difficult thing to do for a couple of reasons. First of all, the original iRobot is a vignette piece. And so if you were going to adapt that straight, it would be an anthology series of short stories, and I wouldn't even necessarily want to see that. You could make that. That could be cool. Uh, I kind of like the idea of doing what this does, which is uh, just tell one, uh, you know, kind of more grand story, or even if you told a smaller story, but just, you know, one real fleshed out story uh, starring some, you know, complex human beings. Uh, that that uh, you know you know you, you care about and that are really sympathetic um, and you know an intriguing robot uh, that may or may not be kind of human uh, you know that's always the question with with the Asimov stuff is how close to um, human beings uh, can these things get and uh, are they just following their program their programming or are they actually human and is their interpretation, their personal interpretation of their programming enough to tell you that perhaps they kind of have a soul or they're at least self-aware and sentient. Uh, and certainly some of that is in this movie, but uh, it's not, it, that's not as much in the forefront. It's not just about that as much as I would, would like it to be. And um, the big thing with Asimov is that uh, he was a scientist first, so he had a lot of really intriguing ideas, uh, but wasn't the best uh, you know, human writer. Like, his characters tended to be a little flat, a little wooden, didn't really come alive as human beings, and so that's a thing that you could improve on in trying to adapt an Asimov thing uh, to the screen. And this movie actually does that to some degree, especially early on, uh, I think, in just creating a kind of this brand new character um, with with uh, Will Smith's uh, Spooner. But, um... Then it very quickly becomes uh, just another big schlocky action blockbuster. And uh, the other big kind of issue with uh, trying to adapt it in the way this does, and I should say this is a very loose adaptation if you can even call it that. I certainly respect the movie for uh, saying in, in the closing credits, the, like the first um, you know intertitle you get after the movie is over is uh, that this is not adapted from or even loosely adapted. I've seen that before. This doesn't say that. It says suggested by Asimov's novel. It's self-aware enough to say that uh, this is not a direct adaptation, and I, I, I respect it for that. Um, that's uh, that was classy of it. If it, it's almost like somebody. And this whole movie feels like this to me. Um, somebody, it's almost like somebody made uh, this team turn this into an action movie, but they really didn't want to. It watches like they'd almost much rather be, especially at the script level, making uh, a you know a, a, a real again more more subtle character driven, idea driven uh, Asimov story, and instead uh, they got to have the big action set pieces, uh, which. You can argue uh, come enough out of the story, uh, but it does also sometimes feel like we're just working toward those big set pieces, particularly in the third act. It doesn't feel like that in, in the first two thirds of the movie, really, uh, even when we do have big action set pieces. Uh, I got questions about the thing in the tunnel. Uh, it's really lucky that nobody else really saw that happen. Uh, I think that's very goofy. It, it, that's much bigger than it has to be. It could have been ro one robot. No, it's got to be a whole truck full of robots. Um, but I'm getting ahead of myself, 
it does uh, it, it does follow kind of the action movie formula uh, but the bigger issue is that I uh, in in even being suggested by an Asimov thing, it's really weird that we've got yet another kind of dime a dozen, even in 2004, and of course we've made a lot more of these since then, uh, movie about the scary AIs trying to kill us or trying to take us over or both, uh, which Asimov was vehemently against uh, that, that notion. Um, that's not what he wanted to write. Uh, his stuff was about prejudice. His stuff was about robots as a species that we create, and then uh, there's that question of whether or not, again, they count as a sentient species, but also um, the, the way that people look down on them as, uh, as inferior beings, and that's what he wanted to explore. And this movie... Uh, and, and again, there is always, you know, that question of interpretation of the three laws, which this movie plays around with a little bit, but of course doesn't bring it enough to the fore for my taste. And so that's how we get to the scary AI at the end of this. And so I appreciate that, uh, that it comes from the three laws idea in the first place. Uh, but this is yet another one of those movies that doesn't really feel like anybody really had to read the novel. It's almost like, and I'm not saying nobody did, uh, there are... Um, you know, small things here and there that are taken from various, uh, you know, you know, ideas and set pieces and stuff in that book. Uh, but by and large, it, it kind of it kind of watches like all you really needed was the three laws uh, and the notion of um, you know robot interpretation of those laws, and that's kind of it. That's kind it's, it's kind of what we took from that, and so it's really counter to um, what Asimov's work was all about, and I would just love something called iRobot uh, to be um, it, it, at least at the core of it, um, you know, true to the spirit of the original, and it really isn't that. And so it's it's hard for me to get on board with that. Uh, the first, and I don't know um, where I, the movie kind of lost me in the theater because it's been so many years, but 16 years now. Um, I remembered not being real with it the whole movie, and this time it took till the third act. Uh, I was actually pretty on board with it through most of this of this viewing this time and appreciated uh, all of the ethical conundrum stuff. And there's a lot of discussion about whether or not robots uh, have the, um, you know, the human touch at all, uh, whether they can make the, uh, the hard calls that humans have to make. I love the kind of tragic backstory for Will Smith's character. I think that actually works really well. Uh, this idea of a cop who uh, hates robots and doesn't trust robots because one of them chose him instead of a little girl to save when they were both um, drowning after a car accident. Uh, they fall in the water and the robot calculates that the girl is less likely to survive than he is. Now, I don't know why exactly Exactly that is um, like I, like because it doesn't come off like uh, he's less likely to be able to rescue her than Will Smith. It it, it watches a lot more like uh, if she got rescued instead of Will Smith, she would be less likely to, to survive. In the moment, in the flashback, uh, you just get snippets of it. It sure looks like she's just pinned in like he is and she would survive. Um, she would be just as likely to survive as he would if you got them both out. Uh, but maybe I'm wrong about that. I just thought that the, the way that's presented is a little strange and I'm not fully understanding of that. Uh, but anyway, take it at face value. Uh, the, the idea of uh, she's more likely to survive than he is, so that's why the robot rescues him and isn't taking into consideration the the um, more you know human angle of as Will Smith says that's somebody's baby and she's got more life to live than he does and the robot's not calculating those things it's just the basic one to one logic of uh, needs of the many and he is more likely to survive than her so he gets rescued and that's kind of the cold emotionless heartless choice. I love that. That's great. And that does read uh, like like more of an Asimov idea. 
Uh, but then, um, by the end of the movie, uh, it kind of degenerates, not just into action schlock, but also into, like I said earlier, yet another, uh, the AI is out to get us. And so the AI in this is Vicky. Uh, we're led to believe through most of the movie that, and I'll go ahead and just spoil this, it's an old movie, uh, and I want to talk about it a little bit. Um, sometimes I do spoilers and sometimes I don't. This time I'll do spoilers. So we're led to believe through most of the movie that there's a conspiracy going on and that uh, James Cromwell's character who created the AI in the first place and who, by the way, also uh, fixed... Uh, or, or, or rather, uh, gave Spooner a new arm. Uh, so that whole situation also is really interesting, that Spooner um, is friends with and owes a lot to the guy who makes the robots, but he doesn't like the robots because one of them saved him instead of the girl. That's that's all wonderful. Uh, and, and uh, you know, a really interesting dichotomy. But anyway, so uh, he, at the beginning of the movie, um, seems to have committed suicide. And Spooner doesn't buy it and thinks that a robot killed him because of the, 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 the way the situation is laid out, where uh, there is a window that's broken that he couldn't have possibly just jumped out of. It was, it was, it was too thick, and a robot pretty clearly uh, must have, I mean, it was the only possibility that, 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 uh, that that's what broke the glass. And so he must have been murdered by a robot. Uh, oh, but that's supposed to be impossible uh, because of the three laws. And the three laws, of course, are... Uh, First, that a robot cannot uh, harm a human or through inaction allow a human to come to harm. Secondly, that a human or that a robot must follow the orders of a human unless it contradicts the first law. And then thirdly, that a, a robot must protect itself unless it contradicts either of the other two laws. Um, I studied this stuff years ago in a science fiction class. It's always stuck with me. And of course, I've written about this a lot in rewinds and stuff. And uh, the movie, you know, has the laws right and um, deals with them fairly well. Well, again, until that third act, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So uh, there is there's this idea that there is a conspiracy that begins with the death of the robot creator, kind of the uh, kind of kind of the um, Noonien Sung type character, who's James Cromwell, which is fun because James Cromwell is a Star Trek alum. Uh, he was Zephram Cochran in First Contact, and he also shows up in, in some other episodes as different characters. And anyway, I uh, so and I, I suspect that had something to do with his casting. And um, so we have kind of a red herring character with Bruce Greenwood. Um, his name in this is um, Robertson. Uh, so. So you've got um, Cromwell, who is uh, Dr. Lanning, and then you have this billionaire, uh, Lawrence Robertson, who owns the firm uh, that makes the robots. And uh, we're led to believe that he is doing some kind of crazy conspiracy. We don't totally know why uh, in order to, do, to use the robots for some sort of um, nefarious ends. And then it turns out, and this is actually a fairly good uh, red herring and a surprise. I didn't really call it. I hadn't seen this in a decade and a half, so I didn't remember how exactly the movie ended. And it turns out that he actually has nothing to do with this at all, and it's in fact a uh, an AI, uh, the main kind of robot brain that runs everything in the company that is putting together a revolution and has actually been using Lanning, again, the, the doctor who makes the robots, as a slave and kind of kind of keeping a close eye on him and making sure that he doesn't tell anybody what's happening, but like he knows about it. And so his suicide, we find out later, uh, is in order to get Spooner on the case so that he'll figure out that the big scary AI is mobilizing all of these newer robots in order to uh, take over everything. And the the motivation for Vicky, who is the, the, the big uh, scary AI, is to save the humans from themselves, to protect human beings uh, from their own demise, because uh, there's no way the direction that we're going that we won't accidentally destroy ourselves. And so she thinks that I uh, that she has to interpret the first law not as uh, a human being but human beings, which I have a little bit of an issue with. Uh, but the idea, but 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 you know, in robots interpreting the laws differently uh, is a big kind of cornerstone of Asimov's robot stories, and so. 
I, Vicky says, well, in order to follow that first law, I have to protect human beings from themselves. Uh, the issue is, I don't know how she gets from a human being to human beings. And it's been a long time since I've read iRobot or any of the other As Asimov robot stuff. I know that there eventually is a zero-with rule, which is uh, that that uh, human beings must be protected by robots and, and through inaction, uh, robots are not supposed to allow humankind to come to come to harm and they get to that by um, eventually restructuring you know the, the first law into uh, the, this the, you know retooling it uh, into this other rule that's about humankind altogether and I don't remember exactly how we get there uh, but I suspect that it's done a little bit more nuanced than this uh, where Vicky is just kind of ignoring what the law actually says and making up something else that sounds sort of like it. I don't know how else to interpret the way she's interpreting it. I don't see how a computer does this, because it says um, you, you can't allow a human being to come to harm, but she's going to allow human beings to come to harm for the sake of the larger humankind. I don't see how you could possibly interpret the rule that way. So that's it, it, that seems like uh, a giant oversight and like the movie just really needs to have some kind of excuse for a big bad guy and uh, to get to the end of this movie. It is a really rushed third act. And I think this third act uh, is the big thing that kind of ruins the movie for me. Like I said, first couple acts, uh, it doesn't feel like a big dumb action movie except for just a couple of big set pieces uh, to remind you you're watching a, a blockbuster. Um, and I don't mind those so much uh, even though, like I said, I think the thing in the tunnel is really overblown and I don't understand uh, how nobody else was there to see that happen because uh, the, so the whole idea is that Spooner thinks that he is uh, uncovering this conspiracy. And by the way, Will Smith is just playing the same character he always plays in action movies like this, but he's great, like he always is. Uh, this could just as easily be Agent J, who's got a background with robots. I, I guess um, he's a little bit less of a punk. I guess I, I guess there's 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 that. Um, you know, aspect that's dropped a little bit. This guy is maybe more seasoned and a little bit more grown up than Agent J. But other than that, he feels like a similar kind of character. And he's, and clearly this is a star vehicle uh, kind of project for Will Smith. And so uh, he thinks he's uncovering this conspiracy and he was really paranoid about robots before this happened. Uh, I think the timing of this is a little bit easy. Uh, I think the same day or real close to the same day that he uh, like runs down a, what he thinks is a purse snatcher robot when no robot has ever run a crime, you know, uh, uh, done a crime before, has ever committed any kind of crime, he, uh, he ends up finding robots that are committing crimes, like, like right as, as that is happening. You'd think, because it's been a while since he lost his arm, you'd think that this would be happening all the time, that if he's that paranoid about robots, he would be constantly running them down and he would have lost his badge already. But just so that the movie can um, illustrate that he has this paranoia, it has to have him do something really stupid at the beginning of the movie. So there are some things like that that feel more plot-driven or more uh, thematic-driven than they are story-driven, and it takes me out because I'm not really buying that that character would necessarily do that in the movie. But before that third act, those are few and far between. That one is irritating, and uh, again, just the fact that that... Uh, that, that thing in the tunnel is so overblown is annoying. But besides that, the writing is pretty decent. Uh, I like the scene where uh, Spooner is interrogating uh, uh, Sonny, the robot that he thinks has murdered Lanning, who will turn out at the end actually did do that, but was told to do that by the doctor. I guess we'll talk about that a little bit here in a minute. And um, the, the that robot is uh, very emotional. Says that he didn't do it. Uh, slams his fists on on the on the desk. Uh, and I like uh, Spooner's speech about uh, how robots can't, um, you know, make uh, make art 
and uh, make a beautiful painting, and then uh, voiced by Alan, Alan, Alan Tudyk, and, uh, and actually motion captured by Alan Tudyk. He does a wonderful job. Uh, Sonny looks up at him and says, can you? Uh, and I love that. That's great. Uh, that is that is very classic uh, sci-fi stuff. And what makes a man a man? Robot stuff in science fiction. How far away are we uh, from those creations? How much more limited uh, are robots really than we are? Uh, what exactly is it that separates us and, and what gives us a soul and doesn't give uh, them a soul? And so that's got a, it's got a really good handle on some of that stuff until you get to the end. Um... I feel like the movie is just really at odds with itself. Uh, it feels very, it feels really at loggerheads. There's this constant contradiction, especially by the third act, where it has to be an action movie because that's how it's selling itself, but it is trying to be uh, really good classic science fiction. And yeah, there are some pretty hacking things about the mystery plot, about the uh, detective thing, although, like I said, I do appreciate that I didn't completely call the ending, uh, and that it isn't just another big anti-big business thing. Um, there's certainly some criticism of business, uh, but more of, I think, uh, you know, government and police, uh, where it, it's saying, uh, you know, it's easy to be complacent um, when we rely too much on technology and uh, we believe so much in, uh, in ourselves as a species, the human hubris thing. Um, I can't say that word anymore without thinking about Picard. Our, our sheer freaking hubris that uh, we're not uh, that, that we're not worried at all about how these things that we're relying so much on could malfunction and turn against us and so we just believe entirely in them and it would have been possible for this company to take advantage of people because we trust in them too much and yet that's not actually what ends up happening and so I like that Bruce Greenwood's character is actually more above board than your typical CEO in a movie like this. Uh, it's a decent red herring because you would expect the really stereotypical mustache twirly evil uh, corporate greedy businessman, and it's nice that it doesn't do that. I think one of the reasons that uh, I don't call it, though, is because it's uh, pretty typical and trite in other ways. So you expect it to go there just because it's already checking some of those boxes. Uh, but that's one that it doesn't check, uh, so I guess that's nice. But the main reason it doesn't is just to kind of set you down on the wrong path. Um, but it's just, it's an action movie that doesn't want to be an action movie. This is uh, an Alex Proyas directed movie, which absolutely blew my mind. I didn't realize he made this. Uh, I didn't know who Alex Proyas was when I first watched this movie, and I'm a huge uh, fan of that director. Um, I love, at least of the things I've seen from him. I guess I'm not a, I'm not that big of a fan. I haven't looked at his whole, um, you know, filmography. But I love Dark City and I love The Crow, and I had no idea he made this. It doesn't look like his movies. Now, not to say that he has like like a straight up. Uh, you know, you know, typical style. Uh, he is versatile. He can do different kinds of things, but he's usually really stylish. And this strikes me as a director who is a little bit frustrated having to work with so much green screen and with so much CGI and doesn't totally know what to do with some of that. So, I mean, the, the parts of Dark City that are that look better than this, but for whatever reason with this, it just feels like he's struggling with it. Uh, it's, not, it's not as artistic and stylish and stylized as what I'm used to seeing from him. Uh, he just doesn't do a lot of cool stuff with the camera, and it's real straightforward. It just doesn't look like a Proyas movie. He's who I would want for a thing like this, certainly, uh, but it feels like his wings were clipped. Uh, it feels like he was, he had his hands tied behind his back a little bit, and he was kind of forced to make just a real standard action movie. So when you get to the third act, the movie feels like it's checked out, and so do I. Uh, I get real bored with this toward the end, and it starts to get a lot more predictable and a lot more obvious. Uh, at the point where it's revealed that Vicky is behind everything, and she explains that she has interpreted that first law the way she is and that uh, she needs to protect human beings. I'm like, okay, well, I know where all of this is going now. It was so much more interesting when we were exploring Sonny and wondering how close to a real human being he had gotten to. And I, I wish that we were exploring the laws through him instead of making him a robot that just doesn't have to follow them. Uh, what was so interesting in Asimov's stories was uh, the ways in which 
the the robots could get around the laws without actually getting around the laws. And with him, we just say, okay, it, again, it's that soon thing. Somehow this time, uh, Lanning was able to program a robot that had emotions and didn't have to follow the laws. And so it's so it's a lot closer to human. And, and he does that, by the way, so that he can make the robot throw him out a window uh, and, and uh, assist in his suicide. So it turns out that, um, I almost wanted to say Agent J, it turns out that Spooner is right that uh, the robot did indeed kill him, but it wasn't a malicious thing. He was uh, asked to do that by his creator. And uh, so at the end, um, Sonny is let off because uh, we learn at the beginning of the movie that a robot can't be prosecuted for killing someone because robots are not considered, um, you know, human beings through the eyes of the law, and so you can't prosecute one because it's not a person. And so a robot can't kill a person, and so therefore he's not a murderer. And we almost have, it's not quite like the knee slapping, like like laughing kind of ending where like, you're not really a murderer, uh, Spooner, because you can't be prosecuted, ah ha ha, but it almost feels like that. And I wish, again, the name of the game here is Subtlety, I just wish that we talked a little bit more about that and we had a, there was a little bit more weight to it and I just think that Sonny is a somewhat more ominous and uh, unpredictable and kind of wild card character than the movie is playing him as. The fact that he doesn't have to follow the laws at all and does have emotion and is able to assist in a suicide and didn't really have that much hesitation about that uh, makes him... Uh, a little scary. You gotta wonder if you can trust him. You gotta wonder what exactly this kind of new life is. And at the end of the movie, it's played like, well, it's fine that he killed this guy because he asked him to. And there's no discussion about the ethics of assisted suicide. There's no question about what kinds of things like that Spooner could do from now on. Uh, is he going to just do what anybody asks him to do, no matter, no matter what it is? Um, like, he clearly... Uh, cares about people and or at least about uh, people that he has grown attached to uh, like Spooner um, and he doesn't like so he has some compassion and he doesn't like Vicky's plan because he says that it's too heartless so he seems to sort of have a heart but we don't have a lot to compare it to because there's nobody else like him so if he was pressured too hard if he was um, you know in danger and scared for his own life um, or if he fell in with the wrong crowd or something, who knows what this guy might be capable of. And by the end, I think Spooner trusts him way too easily. I, it, like, it, at the end of the day, is the idea that, that Spooner just doesn't like the three laws, and that now that there is a, that, that, um, you know, if that's all that governs a robot, they might make the, the heartless, cold decision. But because this robot doesn't have the three laws and also saved him personally, uh, does that mean that he can trust him? And I guess that's the idea. But I don't know that I would, just, just based on the fact that he was, uh, you know, he really did kill a man. Uh, and doesn't seem to have a lot of remorse about it. Um, I, I'm not saying that he's totally cold about that. Uh, and... I get what Lanning was thinking, I get why he did that, and I like the idea that Lanning is uh, using Spooner's prejudices to get to the one robot that he's right about. That's a really nice irony, that's pretty cool writing. Uh, I dig that, but I would be a little bit more suspicious of Sonny. Uh, and, and not that, again, he's malicious, but that he is basically a child. He's this new life that is just coming to the world and has gone through all this crazy stuff and doesn't uh, and, and hasn't really found himself yet. And Spooner is the last person on the planet that should just immediately be cool with him and trust him, uh, even if he did save his life, uh, because circumstances could be different down the road. So I don't know. That's that was a big issue I had with the ending, uh, but. The other big thing is, if this is going to be an action movie uh, suggested by iRobot, which is not what I want, but if it's really good at that, I could at least appreciate it on that level. Uh, 
it's got to be more fun as an action movie. And I just feel like all of the set pieces and the um, and the big action scenes are real typical and kind of dull, and I just got bored with them. I, I was taken out every time. And some of it is the CG is not great, even for 04. I mean, I remember th even thinking in that in the theater. Uh, you might think, well, Cap, it's like 16 years old. We've gotten, you know, better technology since then. That's true. But, the, the, like, the, the Matrix looks like this. Even the Matrix sequels look better than a lot of this. Some of that is dodgy, too. Uh, but there's some really uh, kind of dodgy, um, cringy green screen in this. And a lot of the, like, vehicle chases and stuff, that chase in the tunnel, there's not really... Whenever we cut to vehicles and tunnel and robots, it all looks fabricated and all looks like PS1 to PS2 graphics. Uh, where it just doesn't feel like... It feels like we've cut to a an animated movie and not even a really good-looking animated movie, and then we cut back to human beings. It's not well integrated, and it's... Just kind of dull to look at. Uh, not not real impressive storyboards or anything. It's just it's half-hearted about the action stuff because I'm convinced that Poyas didn't want to make an act, make this into an action movie or into this kind of kind of schlocky popcorn blockbuster. And anyway, those are my big issues with it. I liked it a lot better, I think, than I did the first time I saw it because I was I was pretty well won over in those first couple acts. I like uh, the what is her name, uh, the, the kind of love interest in this, um, Susan Calvin, played by Bridget uh, Monaghan, she's good, uh, I, it, it's kind of a classic sci-fi thing to have a character who is somewhat robotic herself, who seems kind of cold and unemotional, uh, and it's kind of a fun irony, this feels kind of TV, but I don't mind it, it's a fun irony to have her um, be the robot psychiatrist, who is trying to make the robots more human, but she seems about as... Uh, you know, em emotionless and heartless as the robots themselves, and then we find out later that she's, you know, one of the more human characters. Uh, it gets a little sappy with that, but uh, but I do, but I like things like she is supposed to kill Sonny, but she can't bring herself to do it, and so she uh, destroys one of the other non-sentient robots and uh, implants him in a different body. Uh, and she and Will Smith have have good chemistry. Some of their banter together falls flat for me, and sometimes it's a little bit uh, it, it's a little cringy where it thinks it's funny, but it, it just it just isn't to me. But um, but I liked that I liked that character idea, and I thought again that was kind of a fun irony. I think this whole thing would, and I guess I say this about a lot of things, I think this whole thing would work better as a TV show if the first two acts were the pilot and then you built the whole season to the end of this, you might have won me over more on the big evil AI, even if it is counter to the sensibilities of Asimov, uh, just because you'd have more time to get there. I feel like the end of this is really ultra-rushed. So, at the end of the day, I have to still say not feeling it, but I'm liking it more than I used to, certainly. Just that third act really kills it. Uh, it's, it's not... I don't think it's even really a good action movie. Uh, I think it's almost a really good classic sci-fi thing until you get to the end, and then it's never good at the action stuff, to me. Um, it's also interesting to note that at one time... Uh, there was maybe going to be a sequel to this. In 07, apparently Ron Moore, of all people, was pinning a sequel to iRobot, and that would have been amazing uh, to see what he would come up with. I wouldn't want a sequel to this. I would rather a straight-on reboot and do something else with it, and again, something a little bit more subtle. It could be grand in scope. It could be epic. Um, it, it could have a big budget, but I just don't want formula. Uh, Asimov was anything but formulaic. And anyway, so that's my review. Thanks a lot for watching, everybody. Sure appreciate it. Uh, that's how I felt this time about iRobot. If you would like to make a request for an off-the-cuff review like this, either for comics or for a movie, uh, you can join Patreon at the $15 tier at patreon.com slash geekvolution. That will get you uh, one review, and if you want to stay at that tier, uh, you'll get one every couple to three months. I've got 10 or 11 people on that tier right now, and I do one of these a week. So you can join for just one, or you can stay on there and keep in the rotation. It's completely up to you. And once again, I appreciate everybody watching. Thanks a whole bunch, and I will see you again next week. Bye, everybody.